Well, good morning. Well, this past spring, I planted grass in my backyard. And we had done some landscaping to prepare the area for the grass, and it was just dirt. So went to the store, got some grass seed, and there I stood with this large bag of grass seed in my back dirt, ready to spread the seed. And so I walked around, and I spread the seed on the dirt where I wanted the grass, Got all the grass seed spread, and then I had to water it, and it took a lot of water. But eventually, in time, at what seemed to be sort of a random time, that grass seed sprouted and grew, and now we have grass in our backyard. But imagine if I was standing in my back dirt with that big bag of grass seed, And I just was walking around in the dirt, holding my big bag of grass seed. I wasn't spreading it. I'm just walking around carrying that grass seed. I I picture as I think about that, my wife opening the back slider door and yelling out, Hey, what are you doing? Who walks around in their back dirt carrying around a bag of grass seed and they're not spreading the seed? But for many of us, that's a picture of our Christian lives. We've been given a gift. We have a hope in Christ. And, and we're sort of walking around our back dirt carrying this big bag of grass seed with so much potential to be planted, to be spread, to be watered, and then to grow. And yet we're just walking around carrying this bag of grass seed. And whether we're ashamed of the gospel, we're reluctant to share the gospel, we're afraid to share the gospel, whatever that reason is, it's like walking around your back dirt holding a bag of grass seed with so much potential for life, and yet you're just pacing around. And in our text this morning in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11, I picture Paul opening the back slider and yelling out to you, hey, what are you doing? If you want to faithfully share the gospel with non-believers, what must you remember about the gospel? If you want to faithfully share the gospel with non-believers, what must you remember about the gospel? And that is the burden of our text this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the first 11 verses. I would invite you to turn there, and as you turn there, I just want to, as we enter into a new chapter, I just want to set the context briefly what's taking place in this chapter. And so the issue of chapter 15 is the resurrection of the dead. And so there's uh, some disagreement uh, that Paul has with some of the people in Corinth. And we see that if you're in chapter 15, look down at verse 12. He says, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead... How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So there were people in Corinth, even people professing faith in Christ, who didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. And so that is the issue that Paul's addressing in chapter 15. It's really neat to see as we think back, if you can think back, at the whole letter of 1 Corinthians. And chapter 15 acts as sort of a bookend as he talks about the resurrection of Christ, because his burden as he opened the letter was the crucifixion of Christ. So you remember that in chapter 1, verse 18 and 23, really highlighting the crucifixion of Christ. Now bookending his letter with the other side of the gospel, the resurrection of Christ, two essential components to the gospel, as we will see in our text today. But it's neat to see how the entire letter is gospel-centered, and he books it, book ends it with the resurrection. So then in the first 11 verses of chapter 15, Paul lays a foundation for the argument that he wants to make beginning in verse 12. He wants to lay a foundation of 
the gospel. He wants to lay a foundation emphasizing the resurrection of Christ and the proof that we have of that before he walks in to specifically address their disbelief in the resurrection of the dead beginning in verse 12. And so that's the context as we look at this morning, those first 11 verses, that foundation that he lays of the gospel. Follow along with me as we read 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 11. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, As to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Let's pray. Father, as we we open your word this morning, I pray that you would speak to each of us in a powerful way. That you would reveal the truth of this text With perfect clarity, Lord, not because of me, but because your word is so clear. That through the work of your spirit, you would reveal things in each of our hearts and minds and lives that need to be transformed by this text. Whether it be um, something to convict us, Lord, or whether it be something that's encouraging to us, whatever is needful. I pray that you would do that work amongst us this morning. We desperately need to hear from you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you desire to faithfully share the gospel to non-believers, what must you remember about the gospel? And in this passage, Paul's going to remind us of four things that we need to remember about the gospel in order to faithfully share the gospel with non-believers. Number one, remembering the effects of the gospel. Verses one and two. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. What changes? What does the gospel do to you? What does it do in your life? Something happens. Something changes. What effects does it have in your life? Here we see this theme that Paul is going to show us throughout this text. You received, I delivered. Paul received the gospel, he shares it with the Corinthians, and then they receive it from him. Paul's a messenger, he's a go-between, he's passing it along. What he received, he passes along. Okay? He says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you. And so he wants to 
share the gospel with them. He shared the gospel with them. Now he wants to make it known again. He wants to remind them. Okay? You've accepted, you've believed the gospel, but I've been away and influences from the culture and your surroundings in Corinth have kind of infiltrated and there's some Greek uh, philosophies that have kind of entered into your view of the, your, the body and death and eternal life and all of that. And I want to make it known to you again the same gospel that I preach to you. And then he uses three verbs to describe the work of the gospel in their lives. There's a past tense verb, a perfect tense verb, and a present tense verb. And it kind of shows the effects of the gospel in their life. And so he says, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. First, which you received, past tense. I shared the facts of the gospel with you. You received them by faith. Past tense, that happened. You received them. Just like Paul received the gospel, the Corinthians received the gospel. Past tense. Next, we see, in which you stand. Perfect tense. Now, the perfect tense in Greek, Greek signifies a completed action with ongoing results. So something has happened, completed. You stand saved and rescued in the gospel, yet it doesn't end there. There's ongoing results. There's something changes, and God continues to work in your life. I love a perfect tense verb in Greek. It's so gospel-centered, completed action with ongoing results. You received it, now you stand in it. And there's affirmation in that, that I have been rescued in the gospel, and yet God is not finished with me. He's going to continue to work. We see that continue as we see finally this third present tense verb. And by which you are being saved. Present tense, actively happening right now, an ongoing reality right now. It's that ongoing work. You stand in the gospel, and now you're being saved by the gospel. You're justified in Christ, declared righteous once for all, but then you're being made righteous. You're progressively being sanctified throughout your life. Listen again at the, this, this verse. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Amen? That is good news. The effects of the gospel in our life, it's like he wants to stand back and say, listen, I just want to remind you of this beautiful picture of the gospel. I just want you to see it. Before I spell out in detail the facts of the gospel, I want you to see the effects of the gospel in your life. I received it. I passed it on. You received it. You stand in it. And it's not done with you. And now you're being saved by it each and every day of your life as you place your faith in Christ afresh, anew, each morning, and say, Lord, I want to follow you today with my life. It's a beautiful picture, the effects of the gospel in our life. Then we come to this word, if, a conditional, this conditional word, okay? This beautiful picture, and then it's sort of abruptly challenged with if, uh-oh, if what? If you hold fast to the word I preach to you. Now, here, we don't have to get too worried. We just need to understand what Paul is trying to say. Paul is trying to point out the need to actually believe the facts of the gospel. It's not just lip service. You have to actually believe the gospel in order to be saved. You can't just say, I, I, yes, I believe it, and then you didn't actually believe it, and you don't experience the effects of the gospel because you didn't actually believe the gospel. It makes me think of the parable of the sowers. The seed is cast on four different types of ground. Not all of them are new life. Someone might say, I believe, and yet the worries of this world choke that belief out. It is not a genuine belief in the gospel. And so Paul here wants to put a little fear in you, wants to light a little fire under your seat. This is an amazing truth. 
if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, you have to actually believe the facts of the gospel. You have to be humbled and acknowledge, Lord, I can't save myself. I'm a sinner. I'm at enmity with God. His wrath is upon my life. Judgment is coming. You have to humble yourself and say, Lord, I need you. I want you. I need Christ as my Savior. I submit my life to you fully. And through that belief, we are saved. We are rescued. And so it, it, it's a motivator for us if you hold fast to the word I preached to you. And then he ends with, unless you believed in vain. And the word in vain, and the word vain here uh, generally will mean like empty or void or meaninglessness. But here it takes a sense uh, without effect, unless you believed without effect. If you didn't truly believe the gospel, then you believed in vain and you don't experience the effects of the gospel. I was thinking about uh, how we all learn to tie our shoe at some point in life. Usually you're younger and your parents or aunt, uncle, family member, teacher, somebody will show you, teach you how to tie your shoe. It's such an incredible moment in life when you learn to tie your shoe. It's like, yes, I can take care of myself. But if you just go along in life, like enjoying the effects of knowing how to tie your shoe, like I've got this, I could tie my own shoes. But, but you never help someone else do it. Naturally, we, we, most of us will have an opportunity where you could help someone else learn to tie their shoe. Man, it's just so incredible to know how to tie my own shoe. I would love to take some time out of my life to help somebody else learn how to tie their shoe. I'd find great joy in that because of the enjoyment I have and just how easy it is to like, without even thinking, whoosh, tie my shoe. And in the same way, we must remember that the incredible effects of the gospel in our lives, you received at one point. At one point, you were the one that was lost. At one point, you didn't believe. At one point, you had to have somebody share the gospel with you. And then you experienced the effects of the gospel in your life. Well, how silly for us to think that at some point we wouldn't have the same opportunity to share the gospel with somebody else. Somebody else who's in a place that you used to be. That, that you can freely pass it along and say, you know what? Why, I, I don't want to be the only one experiencing this amazing, <laughs> this amazing like new life. I want to share that with others. And so if we are going to faithfully share the gospel with non-believers, what must you remember about the gospel? Number one, remembering the effects of the gospel in your life. Okay, number two, remembering the facts of the gospel. Okay, this is important to know the facts of the gospel. Verses three and four, Paul says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. The gospel message of Jesus Christ is factual information based on the historical events of Jesus, God's Son, God in the flesh. The gospel is not some philosophical fantasy belief that these people called Christians have. It's factual information based on the historical events of a man named Jesus who was God in the flesh. That's what the gospel is. Again, we see, you received, I delivered. Paul passes along the information that he had received, and the Corinthians received it. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also 
received. Paul is simply the messenger. It was the incarnate Christ, Jesus, who came announcing his coming kingdom. He's the one that came and said, follow me. I'm the king of kings and lord of lords. If you want to be saved, listen to me. Follow me. Believe in me. Trust in me. Jesus came to announce himself, and all Paul is doing is continuing that ministry. Say, listen, I'm not the originator of the message. I received it, just like I want you to receive it. We see this a couple other times uh, in 1 Corinthians. In chapter 11, uh, this idea of receiving and passing along in 11, verse 2, he says, Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. Paul's just passing it along. And then later, uh, talking about communion in chapter 11, Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. Paul is not claiming to be the guy. He doesn't want the attention. He doesn't want the glory. He's just a messenger. He, he delivers this message, the gospel, and he says, I deliver it to you of first importance. The, the, this is what he's about to say is the foundational teaching of the New Testament. It's the central message of the entire Bible. And in other words, he's saying, if I don't have time for anything else, this is the most important thing I can share with you. I'll deliver this as of first importance. And then in three succinct statements, Paul lays out for us what he had received and desires to pass on, namely the gospel message. In all the scriptures, this is a unique place where Paul's saying, listen, you sheep, this is the gospel. Let me spell it out, okay? Let me slow down. Bullet point, okay? This is the gospel. And in three succinct statements, he lays it out for us. And so we see that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. So the first gospel fact that you need to know is that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. It did not happen by chance. His death was not by chance. It was according to the eternal plans and purposes of God. This is not some haphazard, last minute, like throw together plan. This is according to the eternal plans and purposes of God. That Jesus would die on the cross for your sins, paying for your sins, taking the punishment you deserved. And saying, I, I've got you. I'll take that punishment so that you can be rescued if you place your faith in me. As we think about this phrase in accordance with the scriptures, we say, listen, this is not just lip service. This has been, this has been uh, we've been looking forward to this, and you can read about it in the scriptures. All through the scriptures, it's pointing to Jesus. It's all pointing to Jesus. <coughs> I love as Jesus shares um, on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, verse 44. Listen to this. He says, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. In that same chapter, he says, I'll teach you from all the Old Testament." And show you how it points to me. I'm Jesus. I'll show you how it all points to me. So in this verse, we have the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Now, it, you're sort of like, how do you get Old Testament out of that? Well, the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, is actually the books of the Old Testament are organized in a different order than our English translations. In our English translations, it's put chronologically where in the Hebrew scriptures, it has a different order. And there's three sections, the law and the prophets and the writings, okay? And so we see the law of Moses, that's the first section. Then we have the prophets, that's the middle section. And then Psalms is the first book of the third section called the writings. Psalms is the first book. So when we see this, it says the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, it's the Old Testament, 
Let me show you how it points to me. And then Isaiah 53 is probably uh, the, the best reference for uh, the truth that Paul shares here in verse 3. For Christ died on the cross for our sins, according to the scriptures. And Isaiah 53 talks about the atonement, the atoning sacrifice of Christ. That through Christ's death on the cross, he atoned for your sins. In other words, he turned back God's wrath. He appeased God's wrath. God's wrath held out against you. That wrath is appeased through the atoning sacrifice of Christ. And that's what's, that's what's taught in Isaiah 53. And as you look at the construction of that passage, the, at the heart of Isaiah 53 is verse 5. Listen as I, just listen as I read this. Isaiah 53, verse 5. It says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He being Christ. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Is that not incredible? Everything that you deserve, Christ puts it on himself. I'll take it for you. And so when we think about these other texts, all through the Old Testament, all through the scriptures that point to Christ, and then we come to the succinct statement in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, as he says that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. We can't miss the significance of that phrase. And the more we know about scripture, the fuller the picture becomes. Because if you can read that little phrase in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, and you can think about Isaiah 53, it really starts to hit home. Christ died for my sins. And it was part of the eternal plans and purposes of God. Isn't that incredible? That's what I call good news. That is good. That's why we're here this morning. That's why we come here every Sunday. That's why we persevere in relationship with one another because it's hard because of our salvation in Christ and that good news. Okay? The second fact of the gospel that you need to know is that he was buried. You're like, really? That he was buried? That's, I need to know that? Now, he's not buried in the ground. He's put in a tomb, right? We know that from the gospel accounts. But he's in there three days. And through the three days being in the tomb, it's, it's validating that he is, in fact, dead. He died, okay? It's not, and some people tried to say, well, he wasn't actually dead, or the disciples stole his body, or, you know, all these theories would come up, but he's dead. He died, and he's actually, he's dead. He's really dead. And so he was buried. To confirm his death, he was really dead, it's interesting as we think about this theme continuing with according to the scriptures, while it doesn't say that specifically after it says he was buried, but the whole, all the gospel facts in a sense are according to the scriptures. In Matthew 12, 40, it says, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. We have this Old Testament story where Jonah is swallowed by a great fish because he's running away from God. God wanted him to go to Nineveh to proclaim the good news and turn, have people repent and turn back to God. And Jonah's like, I'm not going. I don't want to do it. And those people aren't worthy of it. And so Jonah runs the ship. He gets tossed overboard, swallowed by a great fish. He's in the belly of this fish for three days and three nights before he's spit up on the shore of Nineveh. He goes to Nineveh. God's like, all right, I'll take you to Nineveh. But then it's quoted in the Gospels in Matthew 12, 40, just like Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, the Son of Man will be three days and three nights 
in the heart of the earth. Again, it's all pointing to Christ. Okay, the third gospel fact that we need to know that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. Now, this is really going to get at the heart of Paul's whole argument in 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection, that Christ was raised on the third day. The reference to the third day is part of that confirmation. He's actually dead, okay? But he rose from the day or from the dead in accordance with the scriptures. Now, it's really interesting when we look at these three gospel facts that the first two verbs, died and buried, both occur in the past tense. He died and was buried. But then when it says that he was raised, it's in the perfect tense. Completed action with ongoing results. He's alive. He's still alive today. He's alive today. So he rose from the dead, and he's alive. Ongoing. And all in accordance with the scriptures. This is what one must believe in order to be saved by the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you'll hear people say, what's the gospel? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why do they say that? Because of 1 Corinthians 15. That's why they say it. Because Paul's going, hey, this is the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have to believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Not for mine. I have to make that choice. But for your sins. You have to believe that. That he rose from the dead. That death did not have dominion over him, or control over him. He conquered death. He conquered sin. He came back to life, and he's still alive today. You know, it's, it's like you're recommending a restaurant to somebody. You're like, this place is the best. You've got to try it. And then they say, What's, what, what place is it? What's it called? I don't know the name. I don't know. You, you don't know the name? Well, like, wh- where is it? I, I don't know. I don't know where it is. You, it's the best, and you want me to go there, but you don't know where it is. Yeah. Oh, man, it's so good. You've got to try it. Well, like, what kind of food is it? I have no idea. That's ridiculous, right? That's ridiculous. Because I know that all of you have probably recommended a restaurant to somebody at some point. When it comes to our Christian lives, you've got to know the gospel. You have to know the facts of the gospel. You have to know that in accordance with God's word and his internal plans and purposes, that Christ died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried in the tomb validating our death, that he rose from the dead, victoriously that we celebrate every Easter. You need to know that, that someone has to know that they're a sinner in need of rescuing, that Christ died and rose again for you and for me. You have to know that. And so if we desire to faithfully share the gospel with non-believers, what must we remember about the gospel? Number two, remembering the facts of the gospel, okay? Number three, remembering the proof of the gospel. Verses five through eight. He says, And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. It is the resurrection of Christ that is central to Paul's argument in this chapter. And there are people, even Christians in Corinth, who are saying there is no such thing as resurrection of the dead. And so before before Paul addresses that, beginning in verse 12, he wants to lay the foundation and validate and show the proof that Christ is the one that goes before us. He is the first fruits, in a sense, which he will reference 
later in this chapter to say, Christ went first, those who are his followers will go just as he did. Now in the Greek culture, it was commonly believed that the body was like a prison and death was like a release from the bondage of that prison. But it's not resurrection, it's sort of a mystical, spiritual release from the bondage. And in a sense, some of them would welcome death so I could be freed from the bondage of this physical body. And so here in verses 5 through 8, Paul is going to verify and validate and confirm the resurrection and the truth of Christ's resurrection. Okay? So look at all these appearances. Verse 5 says that he appeared to Cephas. Now Cephas is Peter. Cephas is the Aramaic uh, version of Peter. Okay? Now Peter is sort of like the chief of the disciples. He's like... He's the rock upon Peter. He's going to build his church after he ascends back to be with the Father. And so there's a prominence with Peter. Peter, then to the 12, okay, his disciples. He had intimate relationships with them, and so they're referenced first. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. This is the only occurrence of this, this, uh, this, uh, the amount of people that he appeared to. We don't have reference to this in any of the Gospels or in Acts. More than 500. It's this huge group of people. So he doesn't have an exact. So he says, more than 500. There's got to be 500 people here. And he says, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. In other words, he's saying, listen, go talk to them. You, you want to know if it really happened? Go ask one of the 500 people that were there when he appeared. You don't believe me? Go talk to the 500 other eyewitnesses. Verse 7, then he appeared to James. This would be the brother of Jesus. Okay, We read in Acts 15, James is the head of the church in Jerusalem. A prominent figure, an important figure in the beginning of the church, in the establishment of the church. And so he appeared also to James. This is also the only reference to him appearing to James. We don't read about that anywhere else in Scripture. And then it says, then to all the apostles. Verse 8, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, Paul speaking. And so we remember Paul was persecuting Christians, men and women. I'm going to lock you up. I'm going to take you back to Jerusalem. Maybe we'll stone you. Maybe we'll just have you in prison. But we're going to lock up these followers of Jesus. But on his way to Damascus, with a letter of support from the Jewish council, he's going to head to Damascus to seek and search and find men and women who are believers and lock them up and bring them back. And it is the Lord Jesus himself that confronts him on that road and says, why are you persecuting me? Now, if you go back and read that story, I think it's so powerful that that Paul's going to persecute men and women, and yet Jesus comes and says, why are you persecuting me? The intimate connection between Christ and his church and his followers, the oneness, the unity. You persecute them, and I'm going to say, why are you persecuting me? Paul says, last of all, now, we take that to, to mean that Paul was the last apostle, or capital A apostle, the one, one who had seen the risen Lord, who had been given a specific role to be specifically sent to start the church. And he had a specific mission to reach Gentiles. We read about that in the book of Acts as well. It says that he was one untimely Born And the word for untranslated, untimely born, can also be translated miscarriage or abortion or stillborn. Sort of this difficult word, wondering why Paul used it. But I think it's a a matter of timing. It's a reference of, of when Paul became a Christian. You know, he had been persecuting Christians. In a sense, wouldn't it have been greater if he would have become a Christian sooner? 
that he could have been a part of the establishment of the church sooner. And yet, he had persecuted Christians and had to be met by the Lord on the road to Damascus. He wasn't, he wasn't uh, walking with Christ through his life and ministry. He wasn't one of the disciples. He had to meet the Lord even after all these other appearings to Peter and the 12 and to the 500, it isn't until he's on the road to Damascus that he's confronted by the risen Lord. This is just a timing thing. And he just, I think he feels some of the guilt of persecuting the church. And we see that continue in verse 9. He says, he says uh, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. And so we see all these appearings that it, it proves the resurrection. You can say that somebody's resurrected, but prove it. Show them to me. I want to see them. And there are many, 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 many eyewitnesses. And the, and the men that, that wrote the gospel accounts, were, those are eyewitness accounts. It actually happened. You know, I was thinking about kids' soccer's right around the corner. Fall's coming up, people. But I was thinking about with kids' soccer, you know, you play games on Saturday, and then if someone like a grandparent or a family member, somebody wasn't able to go, or maybe they're out of town, but they knew that game was happening, they might call the child, and the first question out of their mouth, did you win? That's always the first question. Hey, you had your soccer game. Did you win? That's always the first question. You, can, you could try to like teach it, you know, you could try to do something different. You're not going to change it. That's everybody's first question. <laughs> Did you win? Now, the kid is going to say, yeah, we won, or no, we didn't win. Now, the grandparents, let's just say hypothetically, they're going to say, oh, that's awesome, or oh, I'm so sorry, right? They're, they're going to believe the kid. Why? Because it's their grandkid, and it's a soccer game. No grandparent is going to say, oh, you won, huh? Prove it. <laughs> I want proof. I want eyewitness accounts. I want a list of everybody that was at your game, the other team's roster, your roster, all the parents. I want their contact info, and I'm going to call them one by one. I'm going to say, who won the game today? Was it the Red Sharks or the Blue Eagles? Prove it. Nobody's going to do that. But when we're talking about matters of eternal significance and what you believe about what happens to you after you die, people are a little more skeptical. They're not just going to take you at your word, you won the soccer game. They're going to be like, prove it. You believe that Jesus was, died and buried and rose from the dead? Prove it. Now, the hard part for us is, as followers of Christ, I think we start to feel a burden like you have to prove Jesus. Like, you get afraid, like, oh, man, I don't want to talk about the gospel of this person because I'm going to have to prove Jesus to them before, so that they'll believe. And I want them to believe so bad because that's what we're supposed to be doing as Christians, but I'm so afraid because I have to prove Jesus to people. Let me relieve the stress. You don't have to prove Jesus to anybody. Let Jesus prove himself to people. God has already proven himself, all you're supposed to do is share Jesus with people. You don't have to prove Jesus. Let God's word do it. Just faithfully share Jesus with people. Because the worst thing that can happen for a Christian is to be so afraid, feeling like they have to prove Jesus, that they never actually share Jesus. Because if you never spread the seed, you're never going to have grass. If you desire to faithfully share the gospel with non-believers, what must you remember about the gospel? Number three, remembering to the proof of the gospel. Number four, remembering the ministry of the gospel. Remembering the ministry of the gospel of the gospel, verses 9 through 11. Paul says, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Verse 10. But 
By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it is I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Paul uses here his own life and ministry as an example for us of faithfully passing along what he had received. And he relies on God's grace to do it. In verse 9, we see his humility, his honesty. He is not afraid to acknowledge his sin, his shortcomings, his failures. He feels bad. I've persecuted the church of God. I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle. I persecuted the church of God. What's the worst thing you've done? And you might think it's worse than that. Maybe it is worse than that, things that you've done. But just like Paul's in needs of God's grace, and God's grace can cover Paul, God's grace can cover you as well, no matter what you've done. That's the message of hope that the church has. But we see his humility and honesty that leads us to verse 10. Verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Stop being so worried about how, who you want to be or what you want to be or, or what you've done or what you're ashamed of or what you're, you feel guilty for. God's grace covers all of that in the gospel. And so we see Paul, the example of Paul's ministry, and he says, my ministry starts with an acknowledgement of who I actually am, a sinner in need of grace. He acknowledges in his life and ministry that I am covered by God's grace, and I am what I am. I've done what I've done. I'm going to be who I'm going to be. And that's okay, because I'm in Christ. And so God's grace covers us, and in Paul's ministry and in your ministry, you got to acknowledge where you're at, what you've done. That's okay. God's grace covers you in the gospel. Then he said, and his grace toward me was not in vain. And I love how he brings this up as he highlighted it in verse 2. He said, unless you believed in vain or unless you believed without effect. Look what he says in verse 10. He says, and his grace toward me was not in vain. It was not without effect. It was not empty. It was not meaningless. It's full and powerful and has incredible effects for your life, God's grace does. It says, on the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Paul says he worked harder than any of them. I think this is a reference to the list above. We have this list of of apostles and and other disciples, and he's saying, I worked harder than all of them. I've worked so hard, though it is not I in my efforts or me at all, but the grace of God that is with me. Paul does not want it to be about him. He wants it to be about Christ. And our ministries should be the same. I love as we think about the ministry of Paul, what he said in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. We minister, we plant, we spread the seed, we water that lawn. But I didn't know when those grass is going to sprout in my backyard. It took way longer than I would have wanted. But you know what happened? It grew. It sprouted. We plant, we water, and God gives the growth. Then he bookends the passage. He bookends uh, these first 11 verses and says, Whether then it is I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. And again, he's just drilling into us. Paul's not the originator of the message. He received it, and he passes it on. You received it. You need to pass it on. He says, I don't care who preaches the gospel, whether it's me or somebody else. I don't care. I just want the gospel to be preached, and I want people to receive it.
In Acts chapter 18, we read about uh, Paul's time in Corinth. And, and Acts chapter 18 is where Paul spends his time in Corinth. I just want you to listen to a couple verses. As Paul is in, when Paul is in Corinth, verses 9 and 10, he says, And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you. Listen to this. For I have many in this city who are my people. He says to Paul in Corinth, I want you to not be quiet. I want you to share the gospel. Spread the seed like crazy. I'll protect you. I'll be with you. Because I, why do I want you to do that? Because I have many in Corinth who are mine. And I'm going to use you as the mouthpiece to share the facts of the gospel so that they can respond. You know, Paul had that vision while he's in Corinth. And then later, he's not in Corinth, and he's writing a letter back to the church, back to the Christians in Corinth. Now, if you had had that vision, and the Lord had said that to you, and you had spent a year and a half in Corinth proclaiming the gospel faithfully and seeing many come to Christ, then when you're writing a letter back We can see why here in these 11 verses he emphasizes the fact that I received it and I'm going to pass it on. It's much more powerful in that context than to just think, I received the gospel, I need to pass it on. Paul's been living it out. I believe, and I want you to believe, that God has many in Deschutes County that are his. Who is he going to use you to share the gospel with? He has people that are his in Deschutes County, and it's his plan from eternity past that you would be the one to share Christ with them and that they would respond to the gospel. I want you to believe that. I want you to pray that way. I want you to have a passion and a love for the lost based on that. That God has many in Deschutes County. I believe that. I hope so. Planting a church, I hope that we believe that God has many in this place. But I want that to become not only my conviction, but our conviction. Because we're a family here in Deschutes County. And God has many here that are his. If you're a follower of Christ here this morning, then we all have a bag of seed we're holding. And we need to spread that seed We need to water that seed and pray that God would give us the growth. And so as I think about just the application of this text, I just, there's a few things. I think we need to spend more time with non-believers. It's hard, but we need it. We need to spend more time with non-believers. I think we've got, and this might just be me, this might not be your situation, but I just think for many of us, and I felt really convicted, especially leading to this passage, that I need to be more intentional about spending more time, real quality, actual time, getting to know and spending time with and doing things with non-believers. I, I spend lots of time with believers. I, I've got that down. I'm always feeling encouraged and supported and loved. And I don't want that to stop, but I also need to make time for non-believers. Because you could say, I want to love my neighbor as myself, but if you're not actually spending time with non-believers how do you, or your neighbors, how do you love them? You can't just say, oh, man, I want, yeah, I love my neighbor as myself. You have to actually like be with people to love them as yourself. Put in situations where it's hard to love your neighbor as yourself. That's where the rubber meets the road. And so it's been my conviction looking at this text, I need to spend more time with non-believers. I need to work that, whatever that looks like, whether it's identifying a couple families that we're going to try to have over for dinner regularly or signing up for things in the community or going to things in the community or inviting people we know to, hey, let's go to the concerts in the park or let's go to, we just, there's got to be time spent with non-believers that all of a sudden you're praying, Lord, give me an opportunity to share the gospel with these people that I'm getting to know. I think we also need to be a little more genuinely interested in other people's lives and ask more questions. And this is, this is a conviction that I've had this week. I need to be more interested in others. 
I need to ask more questions and say, hey, tell me about your life. Tell me about your story. Tell me about your experiences. Tell me about what you believe. Tell me about what you think. I just want to know. Not just with an agenda that I, like, I'm just trying to save you. I'm just trying to, you know, proselytize and get my agenda out there. I'm not, you know, but to genuinely be interested and ask questions. And finally, I think we need to confess our agendas, our wrong agendas, where we're just doing things to sort of check off a Christian box. I had to confess that this week to say, Lord, I, I want to love, I, I want to do this. I, wanna, I want to do this. I, I need to grow in these areas. And I think many of us do. And so I don't want to be a church that's walking around the dirt with a bag of seed, but we're not spreading it. And in this text, Paul opens the back slider and says, hey, what are you doing? Let's reach our hand in the bag and spread the seed and water that seed and just pray that God will give us the growth. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. Lord, I thank you for this text, which just is convicting and encouraging and powerful all at the same time. Lord, thank you for your grace that covers our lives. Lord, we are just so unworthy and so incapable and just have such a hard time to, to do things right. And yet, through the gospel and through your grace, we are just held fast in your arms and your family. God, I pray two things for us this morning. I pray for encouragement in the gospel, and I pray for conviction as it's needed for our personal evangelism. God, we need your help in both. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.